Assalamualaikum and good afternoon everyone. Now we come to the fourth session of our conference. Before that, uh, allow me to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Sharifah Shahira Syed Sheikh is Senior Lecturer at Faculty of Cognitive and Human Development, College Polytech Mara. She received her Master of Human Sciences, Political Science from International Islamic University Malaysia and PhD from University Kebangsaan Malaysia, UKM. Her research in interest includes international relations, gender, gender, public policy, global governance and regionalism. She has published and presented many papers in national, regional and international level on various fields, notably on gender and politics. Dr. Shahira, also a member of National Council of Women's Organization, NCWO. Despite numerous roles and achievements in regional development, the findings in government and civil society reports, as well as social media discussion, portray the detrimental reality of Muslim women due to stereotyping and biased interpretation of Islam. Muslim women are still underrepresented in all sectors and frequently experience discrimination. Although Muslims in general believe that Islam upholds women's rights, Issues such as child marriage, violence against women, marriage rights and dress code remain unsolved. The question remains, are Muslim women's rights moving two steps backward compared to other women's rights in Nusantara? All right, Dr. Sharifa, the floor is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Farouk. Uh, the one that I know, Mr. Ehsan, and of course to the whole mem uh, all members of International Is uh, Islamic Renaissance, Fund, uh, Renaissance Fund, uh, Front. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I am, when I look at the title, I'm very excited uh, to present. But of course, this is very wide scope, Nusantara. So uh, my area of uh, research usually on Malaysian base when it comes to women and also international uh, women's uh, convention, CEDO. Right, so uh, my discussion will be limited to uh, Malaysia and also I do have some uh, data on Indonesia. All right, okay, these are, my, uh, these are the outlines uh, for this evening uh, a discussion. I hope it is discussion. Uh, hopefully that we can actually interact along the way. Um, if you have any burning question, you just can ask immediately. Uh, we don't have to wait until the end of session. 45 minutes for me to talk and then after lunch, uh, my, not really pleasant, right? Okay, so it will be nice for us to just interact. Um, it will be on uh, Muslim population. Uh, this is because I'm, I'm kind of like, would like to know in detail how many Muslim population in Nusantara and also regional and international legal instruments for women. Uh, this one I just would like to introduce to all of you as a Nusantara women and women lovers, all right? Uh, the instrument, legal instrument, internationally and regionally that protects uh, women's and family and society as a whole, all right? Then uh, the concept of equality. Uh, there's a lot of argument to what extent women are equal as men. And in a lot of religious discourse, they like to say no, women will never be as equal as men because a man is the born to be leaders. <laughs> yes, all right, yeah, okay. So, uh, so we would like to see uh, what is actually the real concept of equality. So maybe you can share with me later what, what is your thought about equality. And then um, roles and achievement, uh, productive and reproductive. Uh, male men usually uh, play role more in terms of productive role, but women, we have um, more uh, equally a lot in terms of productive and reproductive roles. So I'll uh, try to elaborate a little bit. Um, what are these two roles? All right. Uh, then, uh, this is the interesting part, the challenges. So, challenges, if you look at um, a lot of United Nations documents on women and also ASEAN document on women, 
there are a lot of challenges. So I'll be highlighting the ones that I, I'm interested. Okay, there are a lot more that I have not, uh, I will not touch here, but you can, you can kind of like just ask the question later about it. And of course, uh, some initiatives in uh, Malaysia and also Indonesia. And then some conclusion. So the word Nusantara, I think the previous uh, speakers has mentioned about this, I'm sure. Okay, it is, uh, it is appears in 1300. Okay, uh, the meaning is island and also in between and including. Uh, this is uh, mentioned by Prof. Hans and also Prof. Rashila uh, recently about China, China and Spartly Island relationship and all those. All right. Uh, currently known as Southeast Asia and ASEAN now is uh, the regional governance uh, for Nusantara. Uh, approximately around 240 million. And ladies, we are not more than men, like being said by certain uh, religious uh, group that we are at the end of the, uh, the, the world. So now more women, it doesn't work that way. Statistics shows that women a little bit lesser in most countries, around 48 to 49 percent. All right, so it's around 120 million. So this is Muslim uh, population. I actually did it manually. Uh, it's a pain, a little bit. Some uh, give me wrong, uh, wrong stats, so I have to recheck, double check. Okay, so if you can see here, although we have three countries with official religion, Islam, Brunei, um, Malaysia, and also Indonesia, but the composition of population of Muslim, if you can see here, of course, the first one, Indonesia. How many Indonesian here? Indonesian? All right. Okay, so you can see 225 million. Okay, I think one of the largest Muslim population in the world, anyway. Um, Malaysia, 18 million. And then followed by Philippines, 5 million. Uh, Thai, 3 million. Uh, Myanmar is a bit conflictual. I can't get the real stats because they kind of like refuse to acknowledge Rohingya. All right, so it's kind of like a few, we go to few sources, it's still different. Okay, so uh, Brunei is uh, uh, 300,000 and so forth. And Singapore is 14.3%. Uh, okay, so first of all, I would like to um, express that the images of Muslim women, if you look at uh, the, the mainstream, it's always black, like me, black and wearing a hijab. But the beauty of Nusantara, it's we, uh, we have freedom to, to express our our image, all right? So we can see, uh, I just randomly picked these pictures, all right? Uh, but I am I, of course, Farah N and also Rafida Aziz. Uh, we have here Dr. One of the specialists on Quran and Sunnah from Indonesia, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rafida, if I'm not mistaken, all right? So, so he, she's uh, more in, uh, into the analysis of uh, Quranic interpretation on women. So it's very interesting uh, to listen to her talk. So this is one of her conference. All right. So first, uh, let's go to a little bit, uh, you know, uh, what we call it, a little bit kind of like dry matters. But it's very important for us to know so that you know that these are legal documents that most states sign and agree with. Okay? So we have universal, of course, declaration, human rights, CEDAW. CEDAW is Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And then we have CRC, uh, Convention on uh, Child's Rights. All right. And then Beijing Platform for Action. So our Indonesia, Malaysia, we send a big group, you know, to show that we are supporting uh, women's rights. Um, and then International Protection on Migrants. MDG, and now we have SDG, okay? So SDG, uh, first of, of course, I will just explain a little bit about CEDAW. Okay, if you can see here, uh, Philippines, Laos, Vietnam, and Indonesia, 
and Thailand, they ratify uh, the earliest. Okay, CEDA uh, is um, introduced and if it effectively uh, institutionalized in United Nations in 1981. All right. So now uh, uh, the four five countries they uh, ratify first. Then Malaysia is a little bit behind. Okay, compared to Indonesia. Okay, Indonesia very early, 11 years earlier than Malaysia. All right. Once you ratify, the country is obligated to present every five years what they have done in order to make the woman's life in Malaysia and in Indonesia a better, uh, a better place to stay. You know? But usually, state will present 15 years after. Combine three reports, two reports. I think Indonesia, uh, Singapore has one of the best track record in presenting. Okay, if Indonesia, Malaysia, we are nearly the same. We present 10 years, 15 years after that. Okay, so these are the article in CEDAW. Okay, if you look at, it mentioned about what is discrimination. Okay, and what are the special measures? What is equality? And of course, the dimension, for example, like stereotyping and culture prejudice. This is something that's intangible. It's disturbed your life, but a lot of people will say it's petty issue. It's non issue. All right? So it's just you, you know, it's not something big. So don't, you know, uh, harassment, not little, little things. All right? Uh, uh, trafficking and prostitution, I think in Malaysia mm -hmm. and in Indonesia, trafficking maybe we acknowledge. Uh, Malaysia, we used not to acknowledge until Tenaga Nita really make a big noise. You know, at first, we kind of like say uh, this victim of trafficking as criminals, but because of the advocacy and the, the you know, the advocacy of the NGO, especially Tenaga Nita, now we recognize that all those trafficking victims as victims, not as a criminals anymore. Yeah? Yes, okay. So it's very, very 2010, if I'm not mistaken, 2007. Yeah, all right. So then we have public and pol political and public life. We will see what happened in our political and public life. Um, participation, international employment, education, uh, equality before law, and of course, for Muslim women, the main thing is Article 16. Marriage and family life. All right. So we will we will know what uh, what's uh, going on in there. All right. So in SDG, it's mentioned in uh, SDG five. All right. About gender equality. All right. Education, uh, providing women and girls with equal access to education, mm -hmm. healthcare, decent work, representation in politics, and also economic decision. All right, so once you are agreeing to this, you need to do action plan how to achieve this, uh, uh, this objective. And there will be reports coming out, okay, to show that uh, each government uh, has achieved all this. And these are the regional uh, legal documents um, uh, in ASEAN, ASEAN base. All right, if you can see, there are a lot of declarations and also in ASEAN chapter mentioned about women's right. I can just uh, share this. I think this slide it will be shared, right? Okay. And these are the ASEAN component on, uh, on women and also human rights. Okay, so we have uh, ASEAN Commission on the Rights of Women and Children. 2010, if you can see that these are the very recent development. It's not like in, eight, in 1969, okay? It's quite, quite recent. And then ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, 2009. ASEAN Committee of Migrant Workers. Why I put migrant workers? Because a lot of migrant workers are women. Okay, especially when it comes to Indonesian uh, Indonesian and also uh, Philippines women. So a lot of them are migrant worker. 
And we have another one, we call it WIPA. WIPA is Women, a Women Parliamentarian of ASEAN Inter-Parliamentary Assembly. So usually they will meet every year, once a year, uh, once in two years, okay, to discuss issues related to women and come up with a resolution. All right, so that's it. That's all about documents, okay? Uh, because I just would like uh, to introduce to all of you that we do have this document and if you need to know more about women in ASEAN, it's very rich. It's a lot of uh, reading materials that you can get from all this. Okay, so now we go to the next one is equality. So may I ask you, um, anybody, when I said equal between men and women, what is, you know, your concept or what is the first thing that you think about? There's no such thing as equality. Okay, all right. All right. Okay, so any uh, gentleman would like to give point of view, equality between men and women? Yeah? Equal opportunity. Lagi? Anything else? Uh, do you think that it is problem, uh, problematic when you mention about equality? When you say men and women are equal, full stop. Is there any but? However, yeah? Yeah, women has different needs, all right? Is it different needs makes women weaker? <laughs> all right, okay. So, uh, the understanding of women and men, usually when we, we talk about religion, it's always like, no. Okay, men are supposed to be, what uh, is Okay, so we are supposed to be memimpin. Uh, so, in other words, uh, we are still the object, you know, that needs to be moulded, you know, all the way, regardless of your age. <laughs> all right? Okay, so understanding that women must be treated exactly like men, if they are to gain equality. So if you want to get what men get, you must be manly. You must be strong. Don't talk about your children. <laughs> All right? You know, and if you are not strong enough, too bad. Okay? Is it good? But it's depressing, right? They are not. Okay, so if women want, uh, the implication of this statement, women must treat it according to male standard. It's not women's standard because we still, our standard is not yet construct. Okay, it's a man's will. All right? Okay. So actually, there are three models of equality. All right? Uh, what are these three models? Okay. Formal equality, protectionist equality, and substantive equality. All right? What are these? The first one, formal, the one that you have mentioned just now. Okay? If you want to climb the ladder, behave like what men are doing. Okay? You'll be fine. But there are things that is, you don't feel right somewhere. It's just not right. Okay? Why? Because it's actually not fair. It's unjust for us to actually follow male standards. Why? Because we have the reproductive role. Okay? Protectionists. Uh, this is what Muslim world always believe in. Why you have to, uh, to cover your aurat? Because you are just like sweet to be protected. Just like food, if not the insect will come to you. <laughs> All right? So it's very protectionist, uh, protectionist. Oh, because women, you are weak, so you better not to do this and that. So there are certain group of people who already decide what you can do and what you cannot do. All right? Like in Arab Saudi, you cannot drive. Why you cannot drive is dangerous. Some, one of the mufti even said, 
oh, if you, uh, if you drive, you can't even give birth. So Malaysian ladies will be just like, Indonesia and Malaysian lady will be like laughing eh, all the way. Okay? And the third one is substantive equality. Substantive equality means, all right, equal opportunity, yes. But the thing is, we, we want more than that. We want equality in terms of result. If we say that um, we treat everybody equal, and then at the end of the day, the CEO of all the corporate companies are still men. The, the, the ladies work so hard. Are we trying to say ladies are not good enough? No. It's because it's just the formal equality doesn't work. So that's why we need to introduce affirmative policy. Affirmative policy is a policy whereby the treatment will be different, but the result will be the same. Yes, and they say it's discrimination. <laughs> All right, but this is the real uh, concept of substantive equality. At the end of the day, because of the effectiveness of the treatment, different type of treatment, this is what makes uh, the equality in terms of the outcome. The outcome will be the same. All right, because women's life and men's life are different. Okay, but the most important, the outcome is equal, is the same. So we emphasize on the outcome. All right, for example, like 30%, at least, eh, not 30% is the limit, at least 30% policy for can, women candidate in PRU 14. I'm still waiting for that. Still not coming out. <laughs> I don't think they, they yes. It's very new, very new policy. Uh -huh. yes. Just uh, in addition to what you mentioned, the 30%, um, we, we are <coughs> fighting for more women to be represented at the board, and of course at the MP level too. Yeah. But starting with the women at the board, 30%. Uh, mm -hmm. When we started, it was only 6%. After we started, it becomes 16 around that. Mm -hmm. um, but we have not achieved the target yet, as yes. of 30, uh, because we want 30% by 20, actually by 2016, something like that. Yeah. Again, you are right. Um, people are always argue that it's a reverse discrimination. Discrimination. A lot of CEOs or managing directors uh, do not agree with it. Yes, because uh, it's something new, because that's why when I say uh, equality, I always mention substantive equality, not uh, formal equality. Because formal equality will not bring us anywhere, because the corporate standard, the politics standard, the economic standard, the structure standard, everything is actually very masculine based. All right? So why? Because if you look at the historical background, we know the experience of women, we are more towards the private spheres and all those. All right? Okay, so uh, I, may I know how, how much time I have? I mean, how long? 15 minutes. Yeah? 15 minutes. Oh, 15. Okay, I, I, better, I better, you know, uh, make it faster. Okay, uh, so this one I just come up with like just a general picture. Okay, social, politics and economy. Under it, in terms of education, research training, health, security, religious tradition, sports and entertainment. And politics, women representation in politics, uh, CSO movement, uh, civil society uh, organization movement, uh, public service delivery, uh, Malaysian, I think, and Indonesia also the same. Uh, women are in public service delivery around 58% uh, more. Uh, like uh, a little bit more than um, men. Economic leadership in corporate and business sectors, as you mentioned just now, uh, entrepreneurs and also employment. There are more than this. Yeah, I just give you a rough figure, an overall picture of uh, what are the roles of Muslim women in productive role. These are the productive role. Next is reproductive role. I understand that when I mentioned that I am feminism, People will be like, okay, so I might be anti-motherhood. I'm not. It's only one group of feminism, anti-motherhood. 
most of other families are not. Okay, so motherhood is actually empowering, not victimizing. And for for me, it is actually the uh, it helps not just private sphere. It's actually help for the country to grow. Okay, in terms of birth rate and so forth, uh, it is tangible power of a state, uh, nurturing and caring. But of course, in this sense, it's not only for women. It's also for gentlemen. Okay, nurturing and caring is the foundation of good community. Uh, if we have this role, this reproductive role between men and women, we will have a good foundation of what is caring community is all about. And then aging population. Uh, even Malaysia now, we are in, in the time of aging population. By, by 2050, if I'm not mistaken, we will have like um, around 5 point plus million aging, uh, aging group because of number one, declining rate of fertility. And number two, uh, life expectancy is rising. All right. So as a country, we would like to have a balance between the two. So it's very important, the reproductive role of women. And of course, also nurturing and caring also from male uh, partners. So in terms of achievement, I just give you overall picture. Okay, in terms of education, uh, last time below 70% in 1980s. Now even in Indonesia, I think 93% for uh, adult literacy. And Malaysia is around 98.9%. Um, increasing number of women leadership, all right. Uh, health security, better better healthcare, um, better security. I put it might be you know question mark. Uh, religious and culture changes in religious interpretation and tradition practice. Uh, I put uh, three question marks. Okay, whether it is true or not. Um, sports entertainment, excel in sports and entertainment. I think you can you can browse to see. Uh, uh, sport women, Muslim sport women, and also Muslim uh, singers, actors, you know, there's a lot of them. Okay, so here is a statistic on Malaysia. Okay, we can see IPTA. 2013, um, uh, we have more surplus of uh, female uh, students, all right, compared to uh, male students. In terms of political development, Increasing trend, but very minimal. That's increasing. I think Indonesia is increasing. Malaysia actually not really. Okay, a CSO movement. There are a lot more CSO movements. All right, we have a human rights uh, and religious-based women's group like NCWO, Kowani, Sister in Islam, and Rahima. I think more uh, Aisha and all those. There's a lot uh, in Indonesia. Uh, public service delivery, more women in public sectors as leaders and employees. Okay, so if this is the employment uh, workforce, and of course, Malaysia is one of the lowest in Southeast Asia, okay, uh, but now they, they kind of like, they do not like to be the lowest, so now it's increasing, all right. This is actually, actually from World Bank. And then in terms of private sectors, in Malaysia, although we are 58%, but most of them are support group, okay? If you look at JUSA, like the top management, uh, male are more, uh, half, 50% more, okay? Uh, Indonesia, I have not get this because I tried to open the Kementerian Pemberdayaan Wanita, but I can't get the slide, I can't get the statistic. So this one is from CEDAW, one of the NGOs. Uh, it mentioned that percentage of women working as service employees is uh, higher than men. Okay, so uh, achievement in terms of economy, as I mentioned, there are increasing uh, trend as corporate leaders. We have AAsia, a COO, if I'm not mistaken, um, and women entrepreneurs, because now you said the usage of uh, uh, digital technology, industrial revolution 4.0. So we have more um, more women to participate in entrepreneur, and increasing number of women in workforce. So if you look at representation decision making, uh, Indonesia National Parliament, 111 are 
a women representative uh, in 2014, 19.8%, okay? Uh, although they have introduced 30, at least 30% policy for quite some time. But Malaysia, we maintain this for the past three elections. Okay? The same number, 10.4%. Okay? So hopefully for this, uh, for this time, it will, cha uh, it will change. So I, I take this from CEDAW Independent Report. If you can see again, the lower position in government, the more women. Okay, the higher, the lesser women. Okay. Even in uh, Malaysia, also the same thing. Okay. So if you look at uh, Menteri, 5.9% uh, women minister. All right. And then if you look at the KSU and so forth, we can see the difference whereby only 7 out of 16. So, in terms of quota system, as I mentioned, substantive equality must have quota system. All right? This is what some men feel it is discriminatory. Even some female feel it is discriminatory. Okay? But for quota system for parliament, only Indonesia and Timor Leste. So, if you can see here, these are the initiatives. 30% uh, women decision maker in public sector and then at least 30% in corporate sector. Indonesia is only one. I double check with my Indonesian friend just now. If they have new development, no. They only uh, have this also. Uh, for 30% candidate for parliament for each political parties. So I really hope, I think a lot of people already advocate for, uh, for political party in Malaysia in January election 14 to also adopt this uh, at least 30% for the candidates. So far, Candidate in previous election, less than 10% are women. So now we go to the challenges. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think familiar faces for Malaysian. All right. Uh, persistent, persistent patriarchal attitudes and deep rooted stereotypes regarding the roles and responsibility of women and men. So just now we talk about. Women should be out there, Pu public sector, behave like a man. You want to climb up, you work together, you know, and there should not be affirmative policies, you know. But in the other side of the story, in the popular culture and religious uh, discourse, in their religious discourse, all right, uh, they believe that if you just Google, it's amazing to see this campaign in hundreds of the uh, blogs. Okay, that at the end of the day, they ask women the best work is to be housewife. All right, and the most pahala is true to be housewife. All right, so here, hegemonic uh, in tradition and religious interpretation. Um, so, why? In order to control, it's a protectionist equality. You know, if you don't control women, you know, women will be in danger. All right. So who needs to control and protect women? Men, all right? And I'm not saying I have one feminist uh, gentleman there, might be a PhD student, you know? It, when we talk about mas hegemonic masculinity, way of thinking, it's not just male, uh, he must be a male, all right? There are also a lot of female also uphold this way of thinking, okay? All right. So, for example, like in Aceh, okay, this discriminatory law by law adopted at the provincial level. I think in Malaysia we have Kelantan, but now because it's near elections, so they're kind of like losing it. So, <laughs> they don't really, you know, they don't really harass women anymore in Kelantan. That's what my Kelantanese friend said, okay. So, Aceh, such as imposition of dress code and restrict the freedom of movement, this is uh, mentioned in the CEDAW uh, concluding observation in two, uh, 2012. All right, then we also have this, whereby they, uh, the netizen nullify the achievement of our Muslim women just because of the dress code. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so at the end of the day, it's not about, they don't discuss about the achievement, they tend to discuss about dress code at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. 
So I have done some social media intelligence analysis on this uh, Aurat issue. Okay. Um, unfortunately, most are negative sentiment. Uh, this is one of my short research that I have conducted before. So it's mentioned that to force, there's a lot of statement to force women to comply certain uh, yeah, it's interesting. I hope you are not sleepy anymore. All right, to comply to certain uh, uh, dress code, men duty to control their wife. So if you don't control your wife, you are not a good man. So there, apa? Kalau najib man. All right. Okay. Then boycott. This is, I, I don't made up the statement. I just take. All right. Uh, boycott. Jangan like uh, gambar tak tutup aurat. Uh, indicator as a bad Muslim. So if you are, no matter how good you are, no matter how, how high you are, if you have achieved a lot as a Muslim woman, but just because you do not fulfill the standard of what they want to perceive you, then you are still a bad Muslim woman. Critica criticize those who prohibit hijab. This is kind of like irony. They kind of like do not like people to prohibit hijab. In other words, they want to, uh, Muslim women to have a freedom of ex expression. However, they want to impose hijab. You know, my stand is, I think a lot of feminist stand is, we are not supposed to impose or we are not supposed to prohibit. It's up to the person. Okay? So, another thing in Sido is, of course, Muslim family law. Okay? So, I think you have seen the most controversial issue recently about uh, one of the artists just divorce his wife so that he can just be with the second wife and all those. And it's so easy to divorce a wife. But it's not easy for a, hus uh, a wife to divorce a husband. All right? Uh, restrictive interpretation of Sharia law in marriage and family matters. Uh, making polygamy easier for men. In 1980s, it's actually more difficult compared to now. So it's kind of like regressive. Okay? In Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkey, Uzbekistan, polygamy is prohibited and are Muslim. Okay, they are still a good Muslim. Okay, in Malaysia, if you, or, or Indonesia, if you say poly, we anti polygamy, you are bad Muslim. Uh, in countries Saudi Arabia, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, and Lebanon, women can include certain provision in the marriage contract prohibiting the husband from taking another wife. Just like what Prophet did uh, for his daughter before his daughter married to Ali. All right? But in Malaysia or even in Indonesia, it's something that is, we, are, we don't practice this. So another thing is about Muslim child, uh, children born within six months. And it, we call them as illegitimate. And women NGOs contest this. And he seem, it seems to be a day they won. So now you don't have to put Abdullah. Uh, you don't have to declare that. The child is illegitimate. All right? Yeah? Um, yeah, it's pending, but it seems to be like leaning towards, uh, leaning towards uh, uh, positive. Because in Indonesia, they don't have bin or benti, so it's not a problem. But for Malaysia, it seems to be like everybody wants to know who are, whether you are illegal or illegal, illegitimate or not legitimate. Uh, and then we have child marriage. Here in Malaysia, it's not much. Okay, it's around 1,000 plus a year. All right? I don't know whether it's much or not. This is very ancient practice. We still have it in Industrial Revolution 4.0. Okay, we still have it. All right? Um, why? Because of no restriction of law. Uh, 16, and, uh, 16 and above, you can get married. But if you want to get married earlier or being forced to marry earlier, then parental consent and a court consent needed and usually they get it right uh, but the thing is about indonesia i'm quite confused the thing about child marriage statistic is not really publicly or, or formally uh, uh, shown to uh, people a dispute to people like this one is unicef but i'm quite surprised to see the statistic it shows that one million to one million plus child marriage in 20 in 2012, then I read in another article, it stated 350,000 child marriage in a year. So I'm not sure which one is, uh, is correct. 
But here we have in Indonesia, the interesting part, they have female ulama. In Malaysia, can we say female ulama? Can we say female ulama? Is there any female ulama in Malaysia? Uh, can we actually be, call them female ulama? <laughs> you, you can. Yes, we can here. Yeah. Okay, so usually in Malaysia, female ulama is for, um, ulama is for male. All right? But in Indonesia, we have female Islamic, uh, it's, it's, it's actually ulama group of women. I mentioned uh, a fatwa against child marriage because it's a bit rampant in Indonesia. Uh, in Malaysia, one of uh, the NGOs said it is mean for us to limit the age. Let them marry it because that's what they want. All right. Uh, these are the factors. Uh, this is one of my research. Uh, and it shows that uh, it is due to minimal law restriction. And another one because they are afraid of pre-marital sex. So that's the reason why their parents or they're being asked to marry early. It is in Indonesia and also in Malaysia. It's the same narrative. They mentioned the same thing. Okay, and then women uh, CSO. This one mentioned in 2018, last February in Geneva, whereby Sister in Islam mentioned in United Nations saying that they being, they being harassed and being labeled. All right. So subjected to harassment and intimidation by state authorities and religious institutions, including through the adoption of fatwa against women's organization. Do we have this in Indonesia? This, uh, this labeling in Indonesia? Because I try to find anybody say bad things about Rahima, I can't find. Yeah. So they have YouTube to explain why cis uh, deviant movement and there are pages and pages from the blog shared about this. All right. So this is the recent one uh, for Malaysian uh, because we went to CEDO to report about Malaysian women. So far, they're satisfied with a lot of things, but they are quite worried about uh, Muslim women's rights in Malaysia. And these are some of the, uh, the yeah, some of the uh, title of the uh, reports, uh, I mean, in, in, in news. Muslim women enjoy fewer rights than non-Muslim, uh, said UN committee. And UN committee is not Western, eh? Some people, when talk about UN, we always thought they are Western. They are not. Uh, they have um, um, kind of like equal composition of the Muslim countries as a committee and also the Western countries. So these are some recommendations in CEDO. Okay, it's mentioned that both eh, for women ministry in Indonesia and women ministry in Malaysia, the least influential, the most under budget and needs to take care of nearly the whole Malaysian in terms of welfare and everything. So uh, UN said you need to increase this. And then um, Malaysian is trying to, to propose Gender Equality Act, I think for the past 10 years, uh, in and out, in and out. It doesn't actually go uh, much. And then compress, uh, compress, uh, Comprehensive Strategy on Result-Oriented Approach to Eliminate Harmful Practice and Stereotypes. And this one, uh, to provide awareness for men and women, school, media, community, and religious group. So I did ask uh, one of the officers in Kementerian Wanita, do we have any module, gender module, for religious departments? Uh, she said, good idea, let's do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, capacity building on women's rights and gender to law enforcement officers. I think in Malaysia, we have I ILCAP. They do have some modules, uh, but it's not really effective. Uh, develop an ef effective strategy uh, with clear parity timelines to eliminate all discrimination against women, especially in marriage and family lives. Okay, so 
uh, this is my conclusion. Then we can have discussion. So we, uh, Muslim women are empowered population. For me, I believe we are empowered. Uh, women, uh, women are empowered. Um, play active role in all sectors. Uh, positive trends in education, workforce, and general well-being. Underrepresented of women, a leader in politics, social, and economic aspect. Patriarchal, hegemonic in religious interpretation, limits and control Muslim women's right. A visible reinforcement of stereotype and discrimination in law policy, teaching against Muslim women's right. Uh, so therefore, we need more initiative, as mentioned in Sidor's suggestion, to eliminate all forms of discrimination against Muslim women in Nusantara. So, thank you very much. I believe reality is what we construct. Uh, I think this is one of the best uh, platform to construct a better reality, inshallah. Thank you, Dr. Sharifa. Due to time constraint, we'll move to next session first. And then we have Q&A session for to talk.